So third commonly cited source of the endogeneity problem is a so-called uh, simultaneity bias. And in fact, this is the um, original context where the econometricians uh, uh, started to understand this endogeneity problem. And this is also where this name endogeneity uh, comes from. So I, before proceeding, I want to highlight this, uh, that nowadays the term endogeneity refers to any kind of situation where the explanatory variables X are correlated with the, with the epsilon, whether it's measurement errors in X, whether it is uh, omitted variables, or whether it is some kind of uh, uh, simultaneity, which we will discuss next. So um, let me briefly discuss the history of the, of the endogeneity problem in econometrics, because uh, it's quite interesting that uh, even nowadays, then uh, the endogeneity problem is not really necessarily well understood in, uh, for example, in uh, natural sciences or or other areas where people people might use regression analysis. So uh, this is something that it's it's uh, originally an uh, economics uh, innovation or economics contribution to the to the statistics, and uh, the original context come from the estimation of uh, uh, demand curves and supply curves. So if you have read some uh, or if you have taken some introductory course in uh, economics, then you probably know that uh, that usually we think about that, uh, that uh, uh, there is there is demand in the market and and we, we think of the demand curve as some downward sloping curve like in this diagram it is this uh, this red uh, red lines and then uh, supply, is then characterized by upward sloping curves, so that is those blue curves uh, um, with the with the upward slope. And then, in this diagram, we have a have price and quantity. So so there is price on the on the vertical axis and quantity Q on the on the horizontal axis. And uh, the market equilibrium occurs when this uh, where this demand curve and supply curve are crossing. So I have indicated this uh, market equilibria by this kind of black dots where this blue and red curves dot. So the idea here is that uh, in period one, there is, uh, there is this uh, D1 and S1, and there is the market equilibrium. And then for the period number two, then there is some shift in both in the demand curve. So demand increases, but also supply increases. So then, uh, uh, the new equilibrium in the in the period two is then in this point where S S two and D two are are crossing. Okay, so the market equilibrium changes from one pe period one to period two, so that uh, price little bit decreases and uh, and quantity increases. And uh, now, if we think about our observed data, so of course we do not really usually observe uh, the um, what would uh, what would be the demand at different uh, alternative prices and also we do not observe what would be the supply if the prices change we only observe this kind of uh, market outcomes so our observed data would be like these black dots we don't observe these red curves and we don't observe these blue curves either and um, uh, in fact in the in the history of economics uh, uh, there was a, perhaps like hundred years ago or something. There was a, was some some debate that uh, should we should we estimate the demand curve, for example, by should we regress price on quantity or should we regress quantity on price? And then then people would find that uh, we get somewhat different uh, uh, demand elasticities if we regress price on quantity or or, or quantity on price. But um, it was around 1940s then uh, the Dutch economist uh, Charles Koopmans uh, uh, recognized this issue that uh, okay actually this uh, these market outcomes uh, if they are like market equilibrium there's both uh, supply and demand in place and actually we observe uh, so if you would naively fit this kind of regression line like this broken line in this diagram then uh, we might get this kind of downward sloping line but it's not really the uh, demand curve, because also the supply uh, conditions might change. So then Koopmanson proposed this kind of system of uh, system of equations that modeling demand curves and and uh, 
supply curves uh, separately. And then we would also need to have so-called instrumental variables to, to be able to identify those, those curves. So this is the original context where this uh, endogeneity problem um, occurred, because if we would, uh, um, because this market outcomes, they depi depend on both uh, supply and demand. And, uh, and if we would just have this kind of uh, um, equilibrium outcomes observed in our empirical data, we cannot really identify the what is the demand, uh, what is the impact of demand change and what is the impact of supply change. Okay, so that's maybe a maybe little bit uh, um, little bit uh, uh, abstract description of the of the endogeneity problem. Let me give another example of the of the simultaneity. So this is maybe maybe easier to understand because it is in a single equation context, like like uh, regression models that we have considered so far. So think about this kind of um, classic Cobb and Douglas production function that comes to the late 1920s. And it's a linear regression model because uh, it's linear in parameters beta, beta and epsilon. But uh, we use this uh, log transformed uh, data of y and x. Is. So think about these x variables as, uh, as uh, inputs to production, typically labor and capital, and, and y is output. And uh, in this context, then, then this epsilon can be thought of as the productivity level of, uh, of uh, firm I. So this kind of cobb douglas production functions have been uh, have been fitted so so far and, and are still still uh, very much utilized in uh, empirical economics. However, there is this kind of uh, well known and frequently cited endogeneity issue that was first pointed out already in 19. Uh, 40s by Marshak and Andrews, that um, if you think about this kind of uh, production function, then obviously um, when, when, we, when we don't make some kind of production experiments, like uh, it, it would be possible, of course, to make, for example, in uh, agricultural production, sometimes people make, uh, make experiments of so-called field experiments where they control the levels of, uh, uh, of inputs. But uh, usually in the, when we observe firms in the market, then obviously then the firm manager decides that uh, how, much lay, how much workers to hire, how much capital to invest. So these um, inputs X2 and X3 uh, are also conditional on the productivity. And of course, the firms also learn about their own productivity over time. So, so the firm manager knows something about its level epsilon before deciding this x2 and x3 so this can be thought of this kind of endogeneity because uh, it's an endogenous this x2 and x3 are not just randomly drawn but they are in they are uh, inherent part of the firm firm's decision making so in that sense they are endogenous decisions of the of the firm managers so this is where this uh, origin of the term endogeneity comes from in the in the econometric vocabulary Okay, and uh, this is not just in the case of the production functions, but this is one one example where this uh, where this kind of uh, issue issue then then arises. So where where does this correlation between x variables and epsilon come from? Then is because the firm managers are choosing this x two and x three conditional on the level of epsilon, or at least the expected level of epsilon. So of course, firm manager doesn't necessarily know. Uh, perfectly this epsilon, but perhaps they know, for example, the expected value of epsilon. And then, then uh, they, they adjust their uh, input levels accordingly. So um, the estimation of production functions is also has been a uh, long term research interest of uh, in my, my uh, own research. So um, I also have uh, conducted with uh, um, our teaching assistant Sheng Dai some uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So I wanted to use this kind of simulations to illustrate you the the endogeneity problem. So uh, we have we have estimated the, uh, such kind of um, uh, the Cobb-Douglas production functions that I mentioned before using such kind of uh, 
synthetic data. So this data set is entirely generated by us. And, uh, and uh, we measure the, the precision of, the, of our estimators by mean squared error, or MSE. So that's just, uh, you can think about this kind of uh, um, deviation from the, of, the, of the estimator from the, from the true value. And it's, it's squared deviation and summed over all observations. And we have also varied the sample size n. So this, uh, this uh, row with the red color, sorry, green color indicates the sample size. So we vary from 50 observations, 100 observations, 200 and 400 observations. And um, in the first, uh, first part of the table, which is labeled as exogeneity, we measure the mean squared error in, the, in uh, estimating the, the output value. And, and MP refers to marginal products, so marginal products of, uh, of, uh, of our, our inputs. And uh, in the first case, this is the, uh, in some sense, the benchmark scenario that what happens for OLS estimator when there's no endogeneity. So if the exogeneity assumption holds, of course, there are some estimation errors, even, even in the ideal case. And this is trying to, to set, the, set the case for that. So, so, so um, if we think about the first, the first row is the, the mean squared error of, the, of our output variable y. So how well we can predict the, 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 uh, the front of this uh, production function and how, how well we can predict marginal products of, uh, of our inputs. And uh, in this, in this uh, first part of the column highlights the fact that, of course, if you have small sample size, then there is some estimation error. But uh, you see that also the, the mean squared error decreases quite dramatically as, we, as the sample size increases. We do not have really, really huge sample sizes here. So 400 is still relatively modest, but uh, for the sake of simulations, we do relatively small samples. Then the middle and the, and the bottom part of the table then highlight how the, how the performance of the OLS estimator deteriorates when there's some uh, endogeneity present. So we control in these simulations that how large is the correlation between uh, our explanatory variable and uh, the error term. And in these simulations, we have um, uh, this um, uh, X2. So it would be the first, uh, first, uh, first input variable is endogenous. And uh, we can have the uh, correlation, uh, smaller, smaller correlation and bigger correlation, because in the simulations, we can control the severity of the endogeneity. So there's like moderate endogeneity and serious endogeneity problem. And uh, notice in this case that, uh, of course, the mean squared error becomes much larger when there is moderate endogeneity. And, uh, and very large when there is uh, severe endogeneity. So these simulations confirm that, uh, that we have a problem if, there is, uh, if, there is, uh, if our explanatory variables are correlated. And um, regarding these input variables, so this MP1 refers to this, uh, this input variable that is endogenous, whereas MP2 refers to the marginal product of the, of the other variable, which is not subject to the uh, endogeneity problem at all. So even if this, uh, this uh, one of the inputs is endogenous, uh, then of course, uh, these results clearly illustrate that the, the um, performance of the OLS estimator deteriorates very much for that variable, which is uh, endogenous, but it's also the endogeneity problem carries over to the other uh, exogenous regression. So you can think about this MP2 as the marginal product of the exogenous re regressor, but even that one is uh, affected by the endogeneity problem. Um, when we had this moderate endogeneity, uh, increasing the sample size helps to some extent, uh, but of course this, uh, this uh, mean squared error is, is still much larger when we have even 400 uh, observations. When we have severe endogeneity, even that doesn't help. Even, even increasing the sample size doesn't really improve the performance. And for the endogenous regression, it even makes things worse. So notice that for the, this MP1 in the, in the uh, severe endogeneity case is actually increasing when the sample size is increasing. 
So this indicates that, uh, that uh, when we have endogeneity problem, then, then the precision doesn't necessarily improve even if we increase the sample size. So what could help? So in the, in the next theme, we will consider so-called instrumental variables. Uh, and uh, we, I will also consider the uh, convex regression or more specifically convex non-parametric least squares. So one of the motivations of, uh, of uh, doing these simulations is that uh, we are interested that uh, is non-parametric uh, convex regression estimator also subject to the similar, similar kind of simultaneity bias. And if it is uh, subject, then then uh, then how much okay but also we compare for the instrumental variables which is the standard econometric technique that we will consider in the next lesson so keep in mind this kind of uh, results of this uh, this one so here we had uh, just the OLS estimator in the first case what is the performance of the OLS estimator in the ideal case where we do not have any endogeneity problem and then how what is the performance of the OLS estimator if we have moderate endogeneity or very severe endogeneity. Okay, so in the next slide over here, then I will compare, but I will only compare the performances in the case of moderate endogeneity and severe endogeneity. And we will use the instrumental variables and convex regression or so-called uh, convex non-parametric least squares. And uh, I'll start with these panels called IV. So, so instrumental variables are the standard uh, econometric solution to the to the endogeneity problem. So whatever type of endogeneity, then uh, instruments can be potentially used. And this is the theme of the next uh, next lesson. So these simulations illustrate to you that by using the instruments, uh, so it is those those parts of the table with IV, then uh, performance of the instrumental variable estimator. Uh, is uh, clearly better than than uh, traditional OLS estimator in the in the endogenous uh, scenarios, and uh, particularly notice that uh, that uh, uh, the performance of the estimator starts to improve when we have larger sample size. So in the in the small sample, the instrument is uh, still uh, subject to quite quite large uh, large bias, and somehow interesting, it's in this moderate uh, endogeneity case even even. Uh, even worse when so so uh, when we have larger more severe endogeneity then the instrument also also does better in that uh, that case and um, so definitely the instrumental variables uh, are helpful to deal with the endogeneity problem so then what about this uh, non-parametric uh, convex non-parametric least squares estimator so from the outset, it's not not directly obvious that uh, that is a CNLS estimator subject to the or, or simultaneity bias because the the exogeneity condition is somewhat different. So the usual type of exogeneity condition doesn't apply, but um, this doesn't necessarily help to convince uh, people that uh, that there's no problem. And uh, indeed. Uh, uh, in some sense, the whole whole discussion in the case of non-parametric estimator is somewhat different because uh, because uh, non-parametric estimator is always always biased. So so we, it's not unbiased to start with. So in that sense, what is the fair comparison with the parametric techniques is the mean square error. And uh, at least personally, I find it very interesting that with the with the non-parametric estimator we can get uh, uh, much smaller mean squared error and uh, and even in the relatively small sample size this uh, these results look uh, extremely good they are of course not as good as the 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 original ordinary least squares estimator when when there is um, um, when there is uh, no endogeneity but still it is it is very good performance in whether it's moderate uh, endogeneity or even even severe endogeneity and um, so the so the potential bias uh, from endogeneity is relatively small, and even compared to the instrumental variables, the performance is uh, is better in uh, virtually all cases when when the sample size is uh, less than uh, less than four hundred. Perhaps when when the sample size uh, increases to several thousands, then the then the power of the instrumental variables becomes more more evident. But at least in relatively small samples, then then 
uh, non-parametric CNLS estimator proves uh, uh, surprisingly robust and uh, and um, and uh, accurate even despite the the endogeneity. So that's very very promising result for the for the non-parametric CNLS estimator and the and the related estimators that uh, that uh, our research group is uh, is studying. So but that, now we are already getting a little bit beyond the scope of the scope of the present course. Uh, so the main thing was here to illustrate that uh, that uh, the, indeed the endogeneity can influence the the uh, performance quite badly, and uh, instrumental variables can help. And another another solution might be might be some non-parametric estimators. There is not enough uh, theory about the performance of uh, non-parametric estimators in the case of endogeneity, and uh, in that sense, this uh, this um, a simulation shed some light to that question, but that clearly also falls beyond the scope of the present course. So in the next theme, we will then discuss this uh, classic econometric solution to the endogeneity problem, namely the instrumental variables. But uh, I wanted to also show that uh, that also also other other solutions are are available. It's not only automatically just just instruments. Thanks for your attention and then we'll continue on the instrumental variables next.